Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to make you stand again. Is that all right? We're going to stand uh, in in reverence uh, to the Word of God. Acts chapter 13 says this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Ilamus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, and he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. May God bless the reading of his word today. You may be seated. We're in Acts chapter 13, and in Acts chapter 13, the church is really on the launching pad. It's on the launching pad. The gospel is on the move, and Really, Acts chapter 13 is where missions gets its birth. The the first missionaries are sent out by the church. And understand this, what started in the hearts of just a few people is about to reach the far reaches of the world. And that's what Jesus wanted, right? Remember Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. If I could give you a very broad outline of the book of Acts, it would be this, write it down. Chapters 1 through 7, the gospel fills Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12, it goes to Judea and Samaria. And beginning here in chapter 13, this is where we see it go to the whole earth. Understand, as we look at the book of Acts, this is our handbook. This is our example. And so we have a mandate as the church of God to get the gospel out there. Amen? It's why we have a missions program. It's why God wants us as Christians to be involved in missions. And so when we talk about missions, you can pray, you can give, you can also go. And I I truly believe you ought to do all three of those, right? Um, And and so as we're looking here, uh, in this passage, it starts out with a number of names. I want you to see these names. We're familiar with two of them, right? We know Barnabas and we know Saul, but we see some new names. There's Simeon. It's the same name as Simon. He was called Niger, which means black. He's likely because he was dark-skinned. There's Lucius from Cyrene, which is located in modern-day Libya, so he's from North Africa, right? And then there's Menaean, okay, who it says this. Interesting thing. He's a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Now, think about this. Herod the Tetrarch is also known as Herod Antipas, He was the one who had Jesus stand before him before he turns it back over to Pilate to be crucified. Herod Antipas is the one who beheaded John the Baptist, right? Just think about this. Menaean and Herod Antipas, they're brought up together. They play together on the playground. Their their families were good friends, right? Their families were both pretty well off, probably. But they make drastically different choices that take them different directions. And so one is an evil king and the other becomes a leader in the church. Can I just say, that tells us a lot about the power of the choices that we make, right? And, and where those choices can take us. But we see in these men this very diverse group. They're from different backgrounds and regions, but in Christ they are one. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 tells us that the church is made up of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, okay? Now, when I look at that verse in Ephesians, I I think the Greek really tells us that the pastors and teachers are the same calling, okay? A better way to say it is is shepherd teachers. 
But in the church in Antioch, we don't see, do you notice that we don't see the title of apostle or evangelist? It says in the church there were prophets and there were teachers. Now, Saul's going to later go on to refer to himself as an apostle. And he and Barnabas, they go out and they evangelize, so they're, they're doing the work of an evangelist, right? Um, but, but think about that word, pro, those two words, prophet and teacher. What is a prophet? Generally, prophets, when we hear of a, a prophetic gifting, is someone who can uh, predict things that are to come, right? But really, here's what the word implies. It's one who shares a message that is inspired by God for a particular people and a particular time. Prophets can teach and prophets can preach, but the difference is that their message is usually anointed with, with a timeliness. And, and so we see here mentioned in our passage that there are prophets and there are teachers in Antioch, and that's exactly what that church needed. And, and so these men that are listed, they seem to be spiritual overseers of the congregation. They seem to be what we would call elders today. And it says, while they're worshiping the Lord and they're fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. It's here in this passage where we see how the elders of the early church function. Again, they met together for worship, and while they're fasting, while they're seeking the Lord's guidance, the Holy Spirit speaks to them. Now, the passage doesn't tell us how the Spirit spoke. And I actually think that's a good thing, because if we read how the Holy Spirit spoke here, we might limit God to speaking in that one way all the time, right? But I hope you know today that there are many ways that God can speak to us. And so we don't know how the Holy Spirit spoke. Was it an audible voice? We don't know. But we know that the message was very clear, and the leadership of the church acts on that that message, right? Now, I I want you to think just how healthy the church around the world would be if we followed the pattern that was set for us by the church in Antioch. We fast, we pray, God speaks, and we respond, right? (laughs) Think about that. Fast, we pray, God speaks, and we respond, and can I just say, in our lives, there, there's always that, that need for prayer. There, there's that need. I, I got to seek the face of God. I need his direction and his wisdom. And so one of, the ways, one of the reasons we gather on Tuesday nights is we can come together and we can pray together. We can seek God together. But look at verse 3. It says, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them out. I love this. They, they hear from the Lord and they act on what they heard. Now, the Greek is very clear here. It literally reads this way. After having fasted and after having prayed and after having laid their hands on them, they sent them out. Now, what would they have prayed for? Well, I think they certainly would have prayed for God's direction and for God's anointing. They would have asked that the Lord would bring fruit out of the labor of these men and that the Holy Spirit would just fill them with power to proclaim the word of God. And and we're going to see those prayers actually fulfilled, right? And so they lay their hands on them. Now, The laying on of hands, if you're from a Pentecostal background, you know about that, right? When we lay our hands on someone. But the laying on of hands is symbolic that the hand of the Lord is on someone's life, okay? There's nothing special about me when I lay my hands on you, but it's symbolic of God's hand being upon you, right? It's a confirmation of the hand of the Lord to bless, to bless their work. And so God is calling Barnabas and Saul to this particular work of ministry, and the church affirms that call. Can I just say that's how it always should be? There's God's calling, and then there's the church's confirmation of that calling and the church's support, right? Basically, they're sending their leaders out to do in other places what they had done in Antioch. And, and, and while I'm sure there's some excitement to, to send them out, I'm also certain of this. There was probably some sadness that Paul and Barnabas would be leaving them. After all, these men had poured into their lives for over a year now. But as these two men are sent out, I think it would mean that some other elders would have to pick up the slack. And I I wonder how those other elders felt about that. I think they realized, man, it's our time to step up. It's our time to serve more diligently. But we see in this passage what God is doing on the earth. Remember last week we talked about how Herod Agrippa seemed to have all the power. He seemed to have all the power when he had the apostle James killed, and now he's got Peter in prison. But all it took was one touch from an angel, and it was all over for King Agrippa. But, but here's this former Christian killer, Saul, right? Together with Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who in the scheme of things, they are really insignificant men. Many people did not know their names. But when God laid his hand on them to anoint them, when they are sent out, the world would never be the same. You have to remember today, as you look at the world around us, as we look at the power structures that we see, that things are rarely what they appear to be at any given moment. 
And there are times when it seems like the world is, is winning. There are, there are times when, when the conditions around us seem to be in favor of the world, but if we step back and, and we, we take a deeper look, we see God is actually prevailing and he will prevail in the end, amen? I, I've read the end of the story, okay? God wins, right? But, but I want you to understand what, what's happening here in Antioch is so exciting because it's the final step of the expansion of the church. This is really the beginning of the missionary movement of the church, Remember, up until this point, the gospel only spread because the church was scattered. It was really persecution that brought the gospel out of Jerusalem. But now the church is becoming intentional, intentional about going to the ends of the world with the gospel because Jesus had commanded it, right? And so they're, they're motivated by the love of God. I think these men really understood, man, every individual needs to hear the gospel, Everyone needs to come to a, a place where they can have a saving relationship with Jesus. Everyone needs to be reconciled to the Father. That's why we as a church have been so passionate through the years about seeing the gospel translated into so many languages of the world. When you talk about the Word of God, understand no other book comes even anywhere near to having as many translations as the Bible. And so we want to see the Word of God continue to get out because we believe that there's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's amazing to me because when Barnabas and Saul go out, they really have no idea how big the world is, right? I mean, they have their minds say, okay, this is what the world is. They, they have no idea that it would take uh, over 2,000 years to complete the mission. But I got to say this, it's really exciting to think that that could happen in our lifetime right? In our lifetime, that the gospel could reach the very ends of the earth. And so every time you pray for our missionaries, or every time you, you give to, to missions, or you give to missionaries, every time you go on a mission trip, you are working to complete what the early church in Antioch started with Barnabas and Saul when they sent them out. And, and so the message from the Holy Spirit is send out Barnabas and send out Saul to the work that I've called them to. And really, the rest of the book of Acts is going to show us what that work is. It, it involves going to an area and evangelizing in that town and then establishing a church, okay? Look at verse 4. It says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now, look at this, because verse 3 tells us the church sent them, right? But here in verse 4, it says being sent out by the Holy Spirit, right? That they were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, so which one is it? I say yes. It's both, right? Yeah, it's both. The church sends them out because of the leading of the Holy Spirit, and so it's really the Holy Spirit sending them out. Listen, when, when we talk about the work of ministry and, and the work of missions, understand that there are some that are sent and some who just went, right? And, and sometimes people go where they're not sent. I, I mean, think about this. The church in Antioch is, is a fairly large church at this time, but there's only two who are sent by the Holy Spirit for this particular task. And of course, John Mark, who's Barnabas' cousin, he tags along to help, right? But understand that God sends those that he prepares. He sends those that he prepares. And, and, and we need to be careful not to let people send us where the Lord hasn't called us. The statistics today are, are just very sad, staggering to me, that half of ministers leave the ministry within five years. And it said that only one in 10 actually retire as a minister. Now, I think there's a number of reasons for that, but I think one of the reasons is that there are those who've responded to the call of man instead of the call of the Holy Spirit. And when you talk about missions, you think missions work is difficult today. It's not as difficult as it was in those first years, right? It's not as difficult as it even was 100 years ago. When missionaries went out at the turn of the 20th century, they would usually pack their stuff not in a suitcase but in a coffin, because they, they never expected to return home, and many of them didn't. Many gave their lives for the gospel. Many missionaries died on the mission field because of disease or persecution or even martyrdom. Second Corinthians chapter 11 tells us of all that Paul endured before he was murdered. But here are Barnabas and Saul, and despite knowing how difficult things are going to be, they obey God, and they trust God for fruit to come out of their lives. And I wonder if we can do the same. Can we trust God for fruit to come out of our lives when we respond in obedience to what he calls us to do? And so they went to Seleucia, but understand Seleucia is not very far away. It's the nearest port city in Antioch. It's about 16 miles away. And, and it doesn't tell us that they did any ministry there. I think they're just get, going there to catch a boat. It's kind of like saying, and they went to Newark Airport, right? They're, they're just going to get ready to go where God would send them to go. 
But when they arrived in that port city, believing that God had called them, I wonder if there was some discussion about where do we go now, right? We can catch a boat anywhere. Where are we, where are we going? And as they talk about it, Barnabas says, why don't we go back to my hometown in, in Cyprus? I, I got some contacts there. I know people who need to hear the message. And so they take a boat to Cyprus, and they arrive in the main port city there, a city called Salamis. Now, this is a good way to start a missionary journey because Cyprus was to them what Hawaii is to us, right? And so good idea. Let's go there. Cyprus had this, this beautiful climate, a very large Jewish population, and it's only about 75-mile journey by sea. Look at verse 5. It says, when they arrived there in Cyprus, in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Now, I want you to see this because this is a pattern we're going to see repeated throughout their ministry. It's this. They go to the synagogue first. Now, now why do Saul and Barnabas do this? Well, they know the, the message is to the Jew first, right? They are God's chosen people. They're the ones who would proclaim the truth of God to the world. That was their mission in the Old Testament. It's still true at this point. However, now that message included the fulfillment of prophecies in Jesus the Messiah. We're going to see that message clearly preached in Paul's sermon next week, actually the next two weeks, but there's a practical reason too that they go to the synagogue first. Because in the synagogue, there's actually a starting point. In the synagogue, there's Jewish people who understand the nature of God from the Word of God. They understand the sinful nature of man. They understand the demands of God. They knew God's attributes. They knew that he was holy and he's righteous, but he's also abounding in steadfast love. And, and the Jews knew that God would not leave sin unpunished. And so when a Jew recognized, yes, Jesus is that promised Messiah, when he or she accepted salvation, that Jewish person would naturally be a part of the core of that new church that's established in the area. We also know this, that there were God-fearers that were attending the synagogues. Okay, these were Gentiles who had a respect for the Word of God, but maybe had not yet converted to Judaism. And some of, some of these synagogue attenders would become elders, actually, in the early church. And the Jews who were not ultra-religious but just really loved God, they would certainly be fertile ground for the message of the gospel. Now, I want you to notice something. Up until this point in our passage, Luke doesn't tell us about any results from this missionary trip, right? There's no salvation stories. There's no stories of, hey, they preach the word and, and multitudes are coming to Christ. They're going to the synagogues across the island, but apparently they're not seeing much fruit. And that would have been hard to take, I mean, especially for Barnabas and Paul. I mean, they, they saw such a, a great response in, in Antioch, and now they've been sent out by the church. But as we come to verse 6, things are about to change. It says, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magi magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So they walk across the whole island from, from east to west. It's about a 115-mile journey, okay, walking on these Roman roads. And on the far side of the island in Paphos, they meet some spiritual resistance. And here's the reality. Before we see real fruit, there's usually a spiritual battle. Before we see real fruit, there's usually a spiritual battle. And the battle here comes from a magician, a sorcerer. The proconsul, this, this uh, Roman ruler, Sergius Paulus, has a sorcerer, as many often did, and the name of the sorcerer is Bar-Jesus, which means son of Joshua or son of Jesus. Now, this is not how Paul's going to refer to him in just a moment, right? <laughs> because this man is a false prophet. And Hebrew law said that false prophets could be stoned, but somehow this man convinced the, the Roman ruler that he had prophetic powers. That's how he got his job but Sergius Paul has heard about Barnabas and Saul. He heard about these two men that are traveling around the island and they're going to the synagogues and they're bringing something new. They're bringing a, a message of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. And so he says, I want to hear about that. It, it says he sought to hear the word of God. He's described as an intelligent man and intelligent men usually want to hear what God's speaking, right? He, he's described as a sensible man. But his magician, also called Illamis, must have had an evil spirit to have been able to try to deceive him. Verse 8, but Illamis, the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Now, why? Why did this false prophet care if his boss heard the word of God? Why would he have been opposed uh, to Barnabas and Saul sharing with him? Because he knew this, it might cost him his job, right? If this guy comes to faith, I'm probably fired, right? 
But, but we need to see that this man was also spiritual opposition to the gospel. The spirit in him hates the message that Barnabas and Paul are declaring. And that spirit doesn't want to lose its power, doesn't want to lose its influence over the island. Understand, it's the same for us when we declare the truth of the gospel. The spirit of this world hates the message of the gospel. The, the spirit of this world doesn't want to lose its influence and its grip over an area or over a people. And, and so we need to understand, church, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, right? It, it's against demons and principalities that are threatened by the power of the gospel in you. Because where the gospel is preached and where people are actually set free, the enemy loses his power. Now, remember, in the book of Acts, at the very beginning, we saw opposition that came from the established religion. It came from the Sanhedrin. And then the opposition comes from a, a political power, okay, Herod Agrippa. But now we're seeing it come from a sorcerer who is inspired by the demonic realm. But we need to remember this, and we need to understand this, that all opposition to the gospel is at its core inspired by the enemy. John writes in 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Listen, when we declare the gospel, understand Satan's not just going to sit by quietly. He's not just going to say, oh, you can do what you want as blind eyes are open, as people see the truth of who Jesus is. Ephesians 5.11, I read this verse yesterday. It says this, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. And here's the thing, I don't think believers have much of a problem with that first part, right? They say, I know that's evil, I don't want to take part in that, I can stay away from that, but here's the question for you, do you expose the deeds of darkness? Do you, do you shed light on, on the devil's schemes? Because when you do, i got to tell you this, the enemy's not going to be happy, okay? And, and the reality is so much has gone on in our nation, so much has transpired because the church has stayed silent. We valued being nice over speaking up for the word of God. There, there are things, listen to me, not just in our world, not just in our nation, but in our county that are taking place that need to be exposed. But hear me, when you expose the enemy, he will attack with persecution. Sometimes we gauge what we say based on someone's reaction. Listen to me. When you're led by the Holy Spirit and you speak some, something and, and the person reacts the wrong way, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have said what you said. <laughs> Are you with me? Sometimes the enemy will respond in that way. We need to be aware of this, church. And we also need to be aware, but we don't need to be afraid, for greater is he who is in us than he is in the world. Amen? And so we need to speak the truth boldly. Verse 9, but Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he looked intently at him. I love that. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. When we think of someone that's filled with the Holy Spirit, we usually think they're just going to say something nice and pleasant, right? But listen to this. This is not what he says. He looked at him intently. I wonder what that look looked like. And he said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you're full of deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? In our lives, hear me today, there is a time for gentleness and understanding, but I also believe there's a time for bold confrontation. And more and more in the world that we live in, we need to ask the Holy Spirit for discernment on how we respond. Because hear me, I think too many Christians just want to be known as nice. Oh, bless his heart. Bless her heart. She's so nice, right? But nice is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I don't think Jesus was ever described as nice. He was described as being full of grace and full of truth. And we should hold those two things together, right? But he boldly confronted the lies of the enemy. He turned over tables. I mean, he had a whip in his hands. That's not nice, right? And, and, and the problem is, I was thinking about this this week. Well, what's really the issue? We want to be loved by everyone. But understand, even Jesus was not loved by everyone. Like, the things that he said, the things that he spoke ultimately got him killed. And in today's day and age, the moment you speak truth, people right away are going to say you're not nice, even if you do it gracefully. We posted something on our social media as a church. We were celebrating the overturning of Roe v. Wade because to me that's a great victory. Now, I know there's things that are happening in the States. I know there's things that are continuing. That fight's not over, right? But I remember as, as a child going to Washington, D.C. with my parents, with the church, and we were praying for that day. And when it finally happens... So much of the church didn't even celebrate. Posted something to our social media, and right away, we get attacked. We get attacked. 
People say, well, pastor, don't you believe in a woman's choice? Doesn't a woman have a choice? I'm pro-choice. I believe in choice. Well, listen to me. In that conversation, what's the choice? And they would say, the choice is not whether to get pregnant or not. Once you have a baby, you already have a baby, right? The question is, if you have a baby, what's your choice going to be? Are you going to keep that baby or are you going to end that life? Right? And so these are the things, but you begin to say them, and all of, a minute, all of a sudden, you're being attacked, right? I've been labeled by some as being a fundamentalist. I got this, this phrase this week. I had to look it up. I didn't even know what it meant. Christo-fascist. You're a Christo-fascist. Okay, all right. But hear me. Church, we can't shy away from the truth because of the labels that the world puts on us. In, in the end, amen. We can't shy away from the truth because of the labels that the world will put on us. In the end, I want to know, God, that I was faithful to say what you wanted me to say. And so again, hear me. I'm not saying we go looking for trouble. But the truth is, when you speak up for the word of God and you stand on the word of God, trouble's going to find you probably in this day and age. I said it, you want to be a rebel in the United States of America, get married, have lots of kids, and go to church. That's, you're a rebel, right? But we can't shy away from the truth. Listen to this. Paul, it says, Saul, who was also called Paul. This is where the name change happens, right? And we're not told why it happens, but it's interesting that it's brought up when, when Paul's trying to share the message with a man named Paul. And so at birth, he's given his Hebrew name, which was Saul, okay? Like King Saul, because he was actually from the tribe of Benjamin, just like King Saul. So Saul, okay? That's how his mom and dad would have called him. That's how they would have referred to him. But nine days after his birth, he was given his Roman name, which is Paul. And the Roman name, it actually means small. I can't help but think that maybe in the midst of such a great demonstration of power that Paul needs to be reminded himself that he's not that great, that he's actually very little compared to who God is. But Luke makes it clear here that Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a reminder. He's, he's still full of the Holy Spirit. He's not just some angry man looking to blow off some steam when he says, you son of the devil. He's making it clear here. Your name may, mean bar, your name may be Bar-Jesus, but you're not a son of Jesus. You're a son of the devil right? Understand, Lucifer is a deceiver, and that's what this man is doing. He's trying to deceive the proconsul. Jesus himself said that the weeds among the wheat were actually sons of the evil one. Now, look at this description. You enemy of all righteousness, you're full of deceit and villainy. I read that, and I'm like, wow, Paul, why don't you tell us how you really feel, right? And then there's this question. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? This was a question, but I also believe it was an invitation, right? There's a chance for repentance, a chance to turn around. It was John the Baptist's invitation to to make a highway in our hearts for the Lord through repentance. And as the kingdom of God has advanced through the years, it's always been met with threats and persecution. Now, Some would say, oh, you Christians, you guys have a persecution complex. I would say, yeah, for good reason, right? Because when you look at the statistics and the data, it said that the number of Christians martyred since the time of Christ is about 70 million. 70 million. A million Christians were systematically exterminated in Nazi Germany. The number of Orthodox Christians and others murdered in Russia between 1917 and 1950 is 15 million. In China, at least 200,000 Christians and foreigners were killed in the Boxer Rebellion. Another 700,000 were killed in communist China between 1950 and 1980. The number of Catholics killed in Mexico from the late 1800s to 1930 is estimated at 107,000, while 300,000 Christians are believed to have been killed under Idi Amin in Uganda between 1971 and 1979. The estimates of the number of Christians killed annually for their faith, they they differ somewhat, but it's estimated that about 100,000 are martyred annually for their faith in Jesus Christ. So yes, we have a persecution complex, I guess. I know I've said it before, but I want to say it again. We ought to expect persecution in our lives as we stand for the gospel. And again, I'm not saying you have to go looking for it, but chances are it will find you. It will find you. So how should we pray? 
How should we pray for our own lives? How should we pray for our missionaries that are on the front lines of the mission field? We need to pray that they would be full of the Holy Spirit. You see, that's the only way that Paul and Barnabas could face resistance like this. And it's the same for us when we encounter those who, who are coming against us. We need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit's voice. And we need to ask this question. Is this a time for gentleness or is this a time to respond with rebuke? But either way, hear me today, it must be done in love. It must be done in love. But understand, when rebuke is given, it's, it's given with a hope that someone actually sees their heart and, and sees the truth and turns and repents. Amen? Verse 11, And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not able to see for a time. And immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Wow. Now notice that Paul says the blindness is going to be temporary. It's going to be for a time. We saw how Paul powerfully declared the gospel of Jesus Christ in Damascus, but we've never seen him like this. And despite the fruit that comes from this encounter, we're never going to see him call down God's divine judgment in the same way. But Paul tells Elymas this. He says, the hand of the Lord is upon you. What a strange statement, right? I, I, the hand of the Lord is upon you. We, we talked about when they were sent out earlier, they laid hands on them to recognize the hand of the Lord is upon you. Understand this, that the hand of the Lord can bring blessing but it can also punish, and it can also bring conviction. And what happens in this encounter with this sorcerer is strangely similar to what happened to Paul at his conversion. Remember, he's on the road to Damascus. He's trying to stop the church from advancing, and he's blinded. Paul couldn't see for a time. Maybe he's speaking from experience. It's going to be just for a little while, but here's what's going to happen to you because you are opposing the work of God. Remember last week, we saw Herod Agrippa's painful fate when he tried to kill the leaders of the church. And now we're seeing the fate of this sorcerer who's trying to stop the proconsul from converting. And here's the truth today. The powerful still think they can stop the church by harming us. Even today, there are those who would come against the church to silence the gospel, but when they reach out their hand to harm us, they will only advance the church and harm themselves. We, we know that China's oppression of Christians has built one of the most powerful churches in the world right now. Islamic persecution has made for some sold-out ministers of the gospel in the Arab nations of the world. Yes, his truth is still marching on. It will not be stopped. Verse 12, it says, then the proconsul, what does it say? He believed. Then the proconsul believed. Understand this. The sorcerer wanted to keep the proconsul from believing, but he actually ended up helping him believe, Right? The judgment that came upon him actually convinced Sergius Paulus, man, the gospel is true. And I believe that he repented. I believe that he was born again. I believe he received the truth of the gospel. And so this missionary trip starts out slowly, but this is the first big missionary gain. Sir William Ramsey, the great archaeologist, he was actually a man who sought to disprove the Bible, but as he studied archaeology, he came to faith himself. But he reports of these inscriptions in Cyprus that bear Sergius Paulus' name, and these inscriptions confirm that he was a Christian and that his entire family actually became Christians. Now, I know that skeptics of the Bible would say, well, Luke looked at historical settings and then he just inserted miracles. He made those up. But do you think someone would write about deception being of Satan in a deceptive story about a miracle, right? In essence, he would be writing his own condemnation. Luke was just doing right here what he did from the beginning. He was compiling an orderly account of what had taken place, and we see it backed up by archaeology. We see it backed up by other historical references in that time. Verse 13, as we move to close today, it says, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't appear that Paul preached in the synagogues in, in Pamphylia, but we see here that John Mark leaves at this time. And I bring that up because that's going to come up again later, okay? Later on, Paul's going to imply that he didn't have the courage to stick around and, and to face the hardships. There it says he left, but the, the word that, that Paul uses is more like he deserted us, right? Now, we know this about John Mark. His mother was probably very wealthy. He, he may not have been used to living with such hardships. And Later on, we're going to see Paul and Barnabas are going to go their separate ways, okay? Barnabas is going to take John Mark, and Paul's going to go with Silas, okay? But the, the, there's this contention over whether or not to take John Mark with him. But what I love is we're going to see on the other side of that, there's redemption. In, in his later years, Paul asks for John Mark to come and help him. In fact, in 2 Timothy 4.11, he says, he's useful for me in the ministry. 
But here's what I want you to see today as we close. It's this, that even when God directs us, even when God's hand is on our lives and he he clearly calls us to something, even when the Holy Spirit leads us somewhere, the path will not always be easy, and yet God will prevail. God may lead us to do certain things for him, and we live our lives and we say, well, I'm just not seeing fruit from that. I'm not seeing results, right? And so we wonder, why would God have me to do this? And the reality is, it's not for us to question God. It's really for us to live our lives in joyful obedience. Would you stand with me? Here's the thing about joyfully obeying the Lord. Sometimes we get to see the fruit later. And by later, maybe that's on the other side of eternity. But I want to tell you that you can be sure of this, that when God directs you, there's a reason for his directing you. There's a reason for his leading you. And, and I believe it is, it is a privilege to join with God in what he's doing. It's a privilege to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And, and as you live your life like that, and in those moments when you're confronted with things, you say, Holy Spirit, is this a time to respond with gentleness, or is this a, a time to respond with confrontation and rebuke? Is this a time to, to boldly proclaim, Lord, and then call sin, sin, right? Call it for what it is. But as you live your life like that, I want to say sometimes you see some amazing results. Following Jesus is, is an amazing adventure, and so I just want to encourage you as we close today. Maybe you're here today, and in the midst of all that's taking place in the world around you, you're overwhelmed, you're overwhelmed, and so like John Mark, you may just say, you know, I'm just done. I don't even know what to say. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to respond. I'm going to back off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back home. But can I just say this? Our world, our nation needs some bold Christians. And, and you might be tempted to turn back. Things are getting tough. But don't turn back because I, I believe God wants to use your life. I believe God wants to use your life. Acts 13 is just the beginning of a journey that's going to transform the world. But if you're a Christian today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a slave of Christ, as we said a few weeks ago, right, understand you're a part of the story. You're a part of the ongoing transformation of lives. And we can see that mission accomplished in our lifetime. And so as we close today, as we close today, these altars are open. Maybe you're here today and you feel like, man, I just... I'm tired. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to respond. When I speak up, it doesn't go well. I don't know if I'm doing it the right way. (laughs) But the only way we move forward, church, is by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be like Saul, like Paul, full of the Holy Spirit. And so if that's your prayer today, maybe you just need to spend some time at the altar today and just say, Holy Spirit, fill me today. Lord, empower me to, to be that voice you want me to be in my home in my workplace. I was talking with two individuals this morning that were saying, you know, they're struggling with with a child that they're trying to speak to and they they just feel like it's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. And both of them said this, you know, the Holy Spirit told me I just need to let him go. (laughs) Same words from two different people. Well, praise God, the Holy Spirit's speaking. You trust him with that child. And, And again, maybe you're here today and you don't know how to respond. Sometimes it needs to be in gentleness. You know when that that needs to happen, but sometimes it needs to be with boldness. And so let's ask as we close today, if you want the Holy Spirit to use your life, if you want to be a a part of this ongoing mission of the church, maybe you need to just come and spend some time at the altar today and say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Amen. Use my life. Direct me on how to speak and what to say. And so as we close, just these altars are open. We'd love to lay a hand upon you and pray for you and bless you.